Welcome, Vera friends and Vera fam, program alumni, mentors, current and future fellows, um, curious students, and proud faculty. Everybody who is in this room right now, Chad, no pressure, thinks that they were your favorite professor. <laughs> so don't, so don't screw it up. We all have the exact same photos. <laughs> we do, but with different books, lovingly picked, given to us. Um, Welcome to the sixth annual Abby Stein Memorial, Memorial Lecture. Professor Chad Infante being here as the sixth speaker after Robert Riggs, Nico Montano, Poppy Begum, Lenny Lewis, and Andrine Wright means it has been almost seven years since we lost Abby. Abby Stein poured her whole self into building the John J. Vera Fellows Program, which was born in 2008. As most of you know, the program is a partnership between the college and the Vera Institute of Justice. Ten students take a weekly seminar in the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies while interning at a Vera or a Vera spinoff agency for a whole year. Elise Waterston and I have been part of it since the beginning and have for the past six years been joined by Nina Rose Fisher. We have seen Abby's baby grow to an alumni family of over 100 students who work as lawyers and social workers, therapists and teachers, researchers and activists, as well as a sign language interpreter a diplomat, a police officer, and a poet. Dan Jelly just published her first book of poetry. I know. Um, Abby would have loved to see this growth in students who, when they were starting out at John Jay, weren't certain that they could accomplish these things. She was fond of quoting her hero, psychiatrist Harry Stack Sullivan, your life is not written in cement during your childhood. You write each chapter as you go along. Vera Fellows are writing an extraordinary book as they are studying and working here in the city. And thanks to the generosity of donors, uh, we have recently leaned into the international aspect of the program with the study abroad opportunity that Elise and Eva Loren will tell us a little bit about now before we get to hearing from Chad. It's always a great pleasure to be here uh, to uh, celebrate uh, the memory of Abby. Our, we call her our dear Abby. Um, Stein and um, and to see all of you here and to think about the enormous growth of the program I mean that we've, we've kept it small 10 students every year but each year you know 10 and then 20 and then 30 and then 50 and then a hundred and it's more than a hundred it's about a hundred and we're almost at 120 I think so it's really quite remarkable and I, I, I think that it has been an enormously life-changing experience for our students, as has John Jay been, as we heard today from Chad, who joined us in the classroom this morning. But it is my pleasure tonight to introduce our first speaker, who's going to give us a brief presentation on her experience. Eva Loren Jean Charles was a Vera Fellow last year, that is the 2018-2019 cohort, because this is a year-long program. And she was one of our younger Virons. She was a junior last year when she was a, a fellow and is now about to graduate uh, in May. And Eva interned at an organization called CASES, which is the Center for Alternative Sentencing and Employment Services, where Chad also interned, where she had the experience, uh, she had the opportunity to experience teaching firsthand and to test if her interest in education and teaching was simply an, an abstract notion or if it was really real and actual, it proved to be really real and actual. And uh, Eva, she can speak for herself on this, but found her passion or knows her passion is education. And she is committed to making quality education accessible and inspiring to young people who before may have been turned away from quality education and turned off by dull and uninspiring pedagogy. So by, en by end of uh, Eva's uh, term as a Vera Fellow, she was accepted into the Teach for America program, um, should she choose to accept their invitation, we, we shall see. And uh, she also has some new wonderful news, which is that she's been accepted into two graduate programs so far. The Ohio, yay. 
the Ohio State Doctoral Program and Columbia University's Master's Program, both of those in education policy. So this evening, Eva is going to give us a very short presentation on her travels to South Africa that she, she took this past January that was made possible by Jeffrey Garral, who I, I don't think is here, but he would, I think he may show up a little bit later, who is the support behind the John J. Vera Fellows Travel Abroad Scholarship Program. And now, Eva. Hello, everybody. Um, and so I just want to start out by thanking uh, the John J. Vera Fellows Program. Like Professor Watterson said, it's where I found what I want to do with my life. So that's Thank you guys for that. Um, and I also want to thank you for choosing me to accept the scholarship because four years ago, if you asked me if I was going to be able to study abroad, I would have been like, yeah, sure. Um, and you guys made that possible for me. So thank you so much. Do I have a clicker? <laughs> thank you. <gasps> thank you. <laughs> so. This is Cape Town, South Africa. Um, as soon as you touch down in Cape Town, you see the mountains and you see the beautiful landscapes. And so as much as I went there to learn and grow as a person and as a student, as an academic, um, I couldn't help but be excited to be in such a gorgeous, beautiful place. And so just so you guys get an idea of where I got to spend the first three weeks of 2020, uh, that's it right there. And so uh, if you look at the mountain and where it's positioned, it's, it's the middle of the city. And so when the Dutch colonized South Africa, um, the entire city was created around uh, Table Mountain. And still to this day, you can see that persisting. The money is around the mountain, and the farther you go out, the darker the skin gets, and the less money that there's, that's getting invested in those places. Um, and yeah, so the resources, the money, the education are all around the mountain. So the University of Cape Town, you have an extraordinarily beautiful view of the entire city. And then if you, as you start to leave, you get closer to the airport, you start to see the townships and the places where um, there's still a lot of work to be done. So I studied abroad through CIEE Study Abroad Program. And this was uh, the group of folks that I got to spend the beginning of my year with. Um, a lot of them were awesome and we had a great time. And I also got to realize the incredible education that I'm getting here at John Jay and the incredible education that needs to get spread to a lot more universities around the country. Um, many students in this group had traveled all around the world between India and Greece and Rome and all of these different places, but being positioned in an African country, they had to uh, come to grips with the ideas that they had of what an African city was and what it meant to be in an African place and what questions you're allowed to ask African people. And um, so we spent a lot of time kind of looking at the similarities but the extraordinary differences uh, between a place like the United States and a place like South Africa. Um, one of the first places that I got to visit was Robben Island. Uh, this is where Nelson Mandela was held for most of his 27 year incarceration. Um, and the picture on the other side is the quarry where uh, men were forced to do backbreaking work um, because they were political prisoners. And in that space, uh, it was dark, it was dreary, and you felt uh, what it felt like, or nowhere near what it felt like to be housed there as an enemy. But um, you felt what it was that was intended when they created a prison on this island. Um, the water is cold, it's dark, there's no windows, there were no beds inside of the cells. Um, when they created this prison, they wanted people to suffer. And they wanted them to suffer because they didn't believe in what the National Party believed in. The National Party is the party that implemented apartheid, and apartheid is South Africa's version of Jim Crow. Um, it's the separation of people by the color of their skin. And so if anyone who disagreed with that, most of them ended up here. Um, we talk about the slave trade a lot in 
world history, but then forget that there were people enslaved on the continent of Africa. And so South Africa as a colony of the Dutch and then the British, uh, slavery was existed there. Um, and not only was it black South Africans, um, but it were West Africans, Eastern Africans, people from Indonesia and India were brought to South Africa to work and to make South Africa what it is today. District six was one of the, uh, I don't know how to explain it. It was one of my favorite places to go, not because it's it's remembering something great, but because the person who gave us the tour was someone who lived during the time um, that the folks that lived in District 6 were displaced from that land and then watched uh, the National Party rip down their homes, rip down their houses, and then do nothing with it. Not that doing something with it would have made it better, but then for you to see them rip down your homes, rip down your, your stores, the things that you owned, and then leave the rubble there for when you have to move from the townships all the way back into the city just to work, you're you're seeing the rumble and the remnants of your home and nothing to show for it. Um, so 60,000 people were displaced with little, uh, with little more than a suitcase. Um, and it was all because District 6 was an area where um, colored people and black people lived together, Muslims and Christians lived together, and it showed people that that could work. And in an apartheid government, they didn't want people to see that that could work. And so it was strategically done that this whole area um, very close to the mountain uh, was destroyed and ripped apart. Oh no. Here we go. The University of Cape Town. The University of Cape Town is known as the Ivy League of Africa. It's an extraordinarily beautiful campus. It overlooks the entire city. Um, and for a long time and still, the student body does not reflect that which South Africa is, and it's gonna take time for them to get there. Um, so the first picture that we're looking at all the way on that side is the ground where roads must fall. Um, it was a hot, hot night. Uh, students group think happened, students pulled things off the walls and burnt them because the administration wouldn't listen to them. They wouldn't listen to the fact that it was harming African students to have to walk on that campus and see Cecil John Rhodes, a colonizer and a man who fed black people to lions um, and displaced people in South Africa, that they were memorializing him on their campus every day. And so the next um, picture, you'll see that that was where Rhodes was and is no longer. And that shadow on the ground was painted there so, so that people who have never seen the statue would know that something was there. It's not just a white block. There was something there as a shadow of it and it no longer should be memorialized in that space. Up here, you're gonna see Sarah Bartman Hall. Um, Cape Town, the University of Cape Town is, is trying to rebrand and uh, take out the names of colonizers and people who should not be memorialized in that space and replace them uh, with notable figures uh, of African people. So Sarah Bartman was a woman who was taken from Africa, brought to Europe, and virtually put in a zoo uh, for Europeans to gawk at. And so when they were deciding what names to change the, the halls and the rooms and the roads in University of Cape Town to, they chose Sarah Bartman for the middle of campus. And then this is just another picture to show you guys how gorgeous the campus is. And I can't wait until the student body and the diversity and the beauty of the student body reflects the beauty of um, the physical campus. So what did I learn? Um, I learned everything I just told you guys, but I also learned the importance of Pan-Africanism, the importance of having conversations with people who disagree with you, uh, the importance of taking a breath before you speak. Um, when I was in Cape Town, there were a lot of moments uh, where people thought that I lived there and that I was a South African person and thought that they could treat me as such. And um, I quickly let them know that that was not going to work. Um, <laughs> but there's still a lot of work to be done in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I also learned that to be patient uh, because there were people in my group who had preconceived notions about what they were going to be 
they were going to go through being in South Africa. They were going to hide their purses and, and clutch their pearls, or they were going to have to uh, use a translator, even though every sign and menu in the entire city is in English. Um, they thought it was okay to ask folks if they had AIDS. And so I had to learn how to take a breath, um, collect my thoughts, and figure out the best way to get in touch with someone who is so far uh, from my belief system. Because like Professor Watterson told you that education is the most important thing to me. And unfortunately, the vast majority of our society is not getting what we're getting here. And so our jobs is to give the people who are not getting what we're getting here uh, this. Um, and I learned that there's a life and there's a world outside of New York. Um, <laughs> there is a world uh, where people where you, we can we consider ourselves as, as Americans, we have a lot of issues to work out here. Um, and then you go somewhere like Cape Town, South Africa, and you see people live in a way that we don't live. How many people do you see smile on the subway ever? Never. There is no subway in South Africa. It's a large metropolitan city. They would really benefit from, from such. And um, I was with people who loved their lives and love their country and wanted to do everything that they could do to make it better. And so all in all, I learned that I will be back in Cape Town, South Africa um, sooner rather than later, and that there's a lot of work to be done and it's gonna take a whole lot to do it. So thank you. Welcome again. Chad Infante received his PhD in literature from Northwestern University in 2018. He is an assistant professor at the University of Maryland College Park, where he teaches classes on Black American, Native American, and Caribbean literatures. Every time I ask a colleague in the John Jay English Department about Chad, we all remember him as our favorite student. Oh, look at all these good program alum. Hello, alumni. Um, in order for this to be true, Chad would have had to take about 39 classes in the department. Uh, he was larger than life, heading the debate team, working with the Urban Mail Initiative, organizing the English Honor Society. Nobody knew there was one. And then, hey, Nico, there's a seat up front. Um, uh, or the Poetry Club. He was also a classroom MVP. When I first had Chad in a course on desert island literature, I took a gamble by starting with Maurice Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are. And I put a blanket down in front of the classroom and invited students to come listen library um, story hour style. And Chad looked at me, as did the rest of his fellow students, like, you're crazy, lady. But with his trademark smile, he got up and came and sat down on the blanket. And with his trademark charisma, everybody else followed, and my semester was saved. Um, it is that yes and attitude that powered Chad through John Jay and his CUNY BA, his challenging Bureau placement at Cases, where Eva was, and through a fully funded PhD in literature at Northwestern. At Northwestern, Chad had to build what he did not find. And in addition to becoming an excellent young scholar with work at the intersection of black and native studies, he created the Colloquium on Indigeneity and Native American Studies. It will surprise no one that he was the first president of this group. Um, under Chad's leadership, Northwestern established the Native American Indigenous Research Center in 2017. Yeah. So in addition to questions about Chad's talk, he would be happy to answer questions about this too, I'm sure. Uh, when Abby designed the first syllabus for the Vera seminar, she included the quotation from Daniel Quinn's novel Ishmael, teacher seeks pupil, must have an earnest desire to save the world. All parents say we don't have a favorite child. We all know that we're lying. Uh, Chad was a favorite pupil of Abby's. And it would not surprise her one bit that he is working to save the world one classroom at a time. It is my great joy to welcome Chad Infante today to deliver his talk, Murderous Sentiments, Anti-Colonial Revenge, and the Interrogation of White Justice. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Um, it is so good to be back here at John Jay. This is, you know, just such a home for me. <gasps> such a home for me, seeing all these familiar faces. 
And I mean, most of my praises for John Jay is literally in my talk, so I'm just actually just gonna go ahead. Okay, so thank you once again, right? It is, a, it is very special and heartwarming, right, for me to return to John Jay as a professor and particularly to be invited to be a part of the Abby Stein Memorial Lecture. It wasn't until the end of my graduate career uh, that I used the word justice in relationship to my project on anti-colonial revenge and retributive murder in black and Native American canonical literature. As opposed to justice, I imagine these representations as acts of care and defense because I want to explore the way that these depictions question and suture the division between the individual and the community, both within and across black and Native American literature. In addition, my engagement with retributive murder as an act of care is itself a criticism of the whiteness of the concept of justice and its relationship to the law. What these depictions of literary vengeance indicate to me is the fidelity of justice and the law to protecting white life over all else. Retributive murder interrogates the equality promised by the law and its refusal or inability to understand the historical and present colonial contexts that might spur individual black and native characters to engage in violence and crime as a political response to a marauding white world. Put another way, acts of self and community defense that dared to resist white violence could only ever be interpreted by the whiteness of the law as murderous or revolutionary desire. Justice then indicated that black and native people had to make themselves available as targets of violence, firstly, by being subject to the whim and fancy of white individuals, and secondly, having to relive that trauma in the structural arena of the courts that actively refuse, um, refuse to acknowledge or reconcile acts of racial violation. Criminal justice scholar Charles K.B. Burton indicates that the distinction between revenge and justice is an imagined and arbitrary difference. In the material performance of the law, the conceptual distinction between justice and revenge dissolve. Justice is merely revenge sanctioned by the state, and I would add, sanctioned by the fiction of whiteness as the sole proprietor of violence. And insofar as the law demonstrates an active investment in white life over all else, justice can be properly named as white revenge. For this reason, for this and many other reasons, justice was not the frame through which I imagined my scholarship. Nevertheless, once the word re-entered my sphere, uh, right, my sphere of reference at the end of my graduate career, I began to see the deep imprint that John Jay of Criminal Justice had on my work and my development as a person. I love John Jay. Like, and I tell this joke all the time that I slept in Brooklyn, but I lived at John Jay, right? <laughs> it's not that funny, but you know, I tell it because it's true. <laughs> And although I graduated as a CUNY baccalaureate student, I only took one class outside of John Jay, which I immediately regretted. <laughs> right. John Jay provided me with the tools necessary to be a critical thinker, but also how to be a thoughtful person and mentor in the world. The interdisciplinary program led me to scholars such as Alison Pease, who in turn inspired me to be an English major. And as an English major, I was exposed to some of the most innovative teachers, Richard Perez, Baz Dreisinger, Caroline Reitz, and Livia Katz, to name a few. Professor Perez was the scholar who ultimately inspired me to abandon ideas of a law degree and to pursue the profession of the literary critic. His sheer love for literature fanned the embers of my own interests in stories and their telling, and I took an independent study in Native American literature with Professor Perez, where he introduced me to the work of Laguna Pueblo writer Leslie Marmon Silco and her numerous renderings of anti-colonial murder. Professor Perez, that independent study, and Silco's work are directly responsible for my current exploration of revenge in Black and Native American literature. Through the world of policy debate and the John Jay Debate Society, coached by the indomitable Whitney Brown, I was immersed in philosophy and critical race theory. And I cannot emphasize enough how significant debate was to my ability to think expansively and to see connections where they might not readily present themselves. But most importantly, what debate and Whitney taught me was that the, was, um, the colonial and bureaucratic life of the university, without which I would not have been able to survive graduate school. I was exposed to the business side of higher education, and this exposure made it clear to me that it was not, in fact, scholars that are the lifeblood of the academy, but the tireless and unseen labor of staff. Dedicated staff members such as Vivian Cabrera, Riemann Douglas, and Maria Vidal, demonstrated time and time and again an unbridled passion and investment in students and their success, not to mention 
the practical means of achieving that success. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Rima. By way of turning more fully to my work, I also want to say that the Vero Fellowship Program and Professor Abby Stein's mentorship helped to shape my understanding of the structure of the law. As a Vero Fellow, my internship at the Center for Alternative Sentencing and Employment Opportunities showed me the intractable nature of racism in the performance of the law and that black life was constantly under attack from white individuals as well as white institutions. While at, um, while at cases, I taught young black and Latino men who could not read, young men in need of resources and care in what is supposed to be the richest nation in the world. The law's dependence on precedence, its inability to take stock of context, and its band-aid solutions to historical and structural problems demonstrated to me a need for its abolishment or complete restructuring away from British common law and other European social standards. While Professor Stein encouraged me to hold open the possibility that people and institutions can change, her unflinching work on childhood abuse and the importance of anger and violent response to that abuse by women and children has also provided me, uh, provided important, uh, has proved important for my own scholarship um, and my work on vengeful representations in literature. My talk today, entitled Anti-Colonial Revenge and Interrogation of White Justice, is drawn from my working book project entitled Cool Fratricide, Murder and Metaphysics in Black and Indigenous Literature. By way of example, I want to open right, with a few images that represent black and indigenous expressions of anti-colonial vengeance. Ah, there we go. These paintings raise a set of metaphysical questions in the abstract, asking us to contemplate the value and meaning of life in a white world. They raise a host of questions about the possible ethics and efficacy of black and indigenous defense and anti-colonial violence, especially given that the law and justice, as it is currently understood, is intimately invested in protecting white life over all else. They allow us to ask about the nature of art and life itself, to ask what are the psychic and philosophical contours of murder sentiments? What are its aesthetic, ethical, and political dimensions? What kind of gendered, sexual, what kind of gendered and sexual investments does it evince? And most importantly for me, what can it tell us of blackness and Indianness's relationship to one another? What makes representations of retributive murder in black and native literature against the figure of the white colonizer philosophically significant is a relative scarcity of any material corollary. By this, I mean that while we often hear of real world events in which, white, in which disgruntled white citizens or state actors attack black and native people, instances in which black or native people attacked white people for being white are relatively small. Glenn Coulthard adds that negative emotions in response to colonial trauma such as anger and resentment are imagined, quote, in an unsympathetic light, as irrational, as physically and psychologically unhealthy, as reactionary, backward looking, and even as social pathology, end quote. Bell Hooks adds to this point when she says, quote, black people could die from feeling rage and expressing it to the wrong white folks. We learned to choke down our rage, to express rage in, the context was su in that context was suicidal. Rage was reserved for life at home for one another. Instead, black and native people house their feelings of vengeance in bodies of art precisely because they recognize the value of life and also because they know and expect white retaliation merely at the thought of defense and retribution. In this paper, I argue that representations of anti-colonial murder and vengeance in black and indigenous literature is intimately related to the abstract and explicit form of a question, a form of philosophical and particularly metaphysical interrogation. I take shared representations of retributive murder in these literary traditions to argue for a cross-conversation between black and native studies. In depicting anti-colonial murder, black and native authors often invoke each other's history to point toward the unforgivable scope of white crime. Representations of retributive murder and feelings of racial revenge and resentment also constitutes an essential queer and feminist anti-colonial trope, central to both the form and content of black and indigenous canonical literature. In these works, representations of murder do not reflect pathology, hatred, or the fiction of reverse racism. Instead, I contend that the trope is used to ask a series of metaphysical and ethical questions about the West's seeming monopoly on life itself. 
In the opening of Alice Walker's 1976 novel, Meridian, the title character is asked an important question by a group of young revolutionary black women from the 1960s. This opening question freezes Meridian in place, causes her to cascade into a series of vivid memories and a mounting set of questions that oscillates between the beauty and trauma of black life. The novel explains, to join this group, she must make a declaration of her willingness to die for the revolution, which she has done. She must also answer the question, will you kill for the revolution, with a positive yes. Unable to answer the question, she falls deeper into memory, and the novel continues, when she was transformed in church, it was always by the purity of the singer's soul which she could actually hear. The purity that lifted their voice, their songs like a flight, of uh, a flight of doves above her music drunk head. If they committed murder, and to her even revolutionary murder was murder, what would the music sound like, be like? These accumulating queries move Meridian to remember, quote, a perennial conversation between her parents regarding Indians. Native America provides both frame for and contrast between competing formulas of black freedom in the novel, represented by black masculine flight and black women's work in cultivating community. These differing strategies place the characters in conversation and conflict with Native America, adding another layer of complexity to Meridian's conceptual questions about politics and life. These literary questions concerning the efficacy of black political violence and its effects on the black soul is one of the central questions that the novels attempts to work through. Rather than jettison violence altogether or thinking of it solely as a problem or thinking of it as a problem solely belonging to a masculine public sphere, the novel transforms violence into gestures and questions about the fate of black and native women, family and life itself. I take Meridian's literary questioning about black political uh, violence and its relationship to gender and Native America as an opening to read black and Native American literature together through their shared representations of retributive feeling against the figure of the white colonizer. And I open with Meridian precisely because the novel begins explicitly with a question of retribution that other texts pose abstractly or work their way towards. The repetition of this trope of murder as a philosophical question in the corpus of Native American uh, writer Leslie Marmon Silko indicates its centrality and ubiquity in indigenous literature. Storyteller, right, in particular, is significant in this regard. Storyteller Silko's 19, 1981 collection of short stories, poems, autobiographical accounts, and family photographs. In the title short story, a nameless Inuit woman murders the white store clerk who killed her parents by selling them gasoline and telling them it was safe to drink. She kills him by leading him out to thin ice where he falls through and dies. She takes the long route across, knowing that he will choose the short path in order to catch her. However, the short cut runs directly across the heart of the river where the rushing water causes the ice to be thin. The protagonist uses her intimacy with the ice, river, and her parents as a source of murderous vengeance. The story says, she was familiar with the river, down to the instant ice flexed into hairline fractures and the cracking bone silver sounds gathered momentum with the opening ice until the churning gray water was set free. She's arrested for the act, but when the local lawyers arrive to question her and despite his objections that it was an accident, she insists that she killed him. She says, he lied to them. He told them it was safe to drink, but I won't lie. I killed him. I will not change the story, not even to escape this place and go home. I intended that he die. The story must be told as it is. Attempting to love her dead parents, the narrator engages the lawyer's interrogation, responds to his question with an unflinching truth. In other words, she, in other words her answer responds not only to the asked question of personal motive, but to the unasked question about the broader historical context, the unspeakable question about the feelings and consequences produced by a history of colonial genocide. In her, in her epic 1991 novel, Almanac of the Dead, Silko joins her representations of murderous desire to dreams of continental revolt that connects Africa and the Americas, saying, quote, no one knows where Africa ends and America begins. With similar queries of reckoning, June Jordan's poem, Poem About Police Violence, asks, quote, what you think would happen 
If every time they kill a black boy, then we kill a cop. In Louise Erdridge's novel, The Roundhouse, after the young native men, Joe and Cappy, kill the white rapist who attacked Joe's mother, Cappy asks, what are we? What are we now? What these inquiries make evident, as Frank D. Wilderson and Patrice Douglas argues, is that just, just as the violence of colonialism marks the emergence of global Western, global Western thought, so too does violence constitutes the contours of anti-colonial philosophy, bound as it is to an ongoing history of a Western metaphysics. It is metaphysics and life as both material and abstract concept that these representations and metaphors of anti-colonial murder attempt to explore. This grammar of interrogation uses violence to anatomize colonial systems. Yet, these imaginings of violence are simultaneously acts of care, where murderous and vengeful feeling is not pacified or domesticated by intimacy, but fortified and strengthened by it. But these acts of, feel, of freeing and loving, these flights of intimacy, manifests as retributive murder because, of, um, because whiteness is dogged in its assault on black and native living. It is this penchant for creating and cultivating community that separates feminist and queer renditions of murder from masculine ones that use violence as an act of self-creation. As Abby Stein explains in her text, Cupid's Knife, while both men and women are apt to deal with trauma through unconscious repetition, quote, unlike the man, the woman will probably refrain from mastering trauma through perpetuation. Unlike masculinist works such as Richard Wright's Native Son and N. Scott Mamadi's House Made of Dawn that engage murder as a form of self-actualization, the texts I explore use murder to ask questions rather than to make declarations about the self. In House Made of Dawn, the, protag the native protagonist, Abel, who suffers from PTSD, kills an albino man, um, kills an albino uh, Navajo man named Juan Reyes. While Abel's murder does induce a sense of curiosity quest and questioning in him, his refusal to recognize that Juan is native and his insistence on calling him the white man makes it near impossible to see the constitutive intimacy that connect and separate them. Watching the white man's body dissolve into the rain, the novel explains, and Abel was no longer terrified, but strangely cautious and intent, full of wonder and regard. He could not think. There was nothing but a cold and extinctive will to wonder and regard. Abel's questioning and wonder is forestalled by his coldness, by his masculine tendency towards reticence and isolation, and because of his lack of realization of kinship with one. What Abel's, mur what Abel's wonder surrounding murder misses is that it is not white skin alone that constitutes whiteness and secular colonial violence, but a constitutive view of the world as dead and instrumental. In this way, he misrecognizes one as a white man, not because his actions display whiteness, but because his skin is white. Here, masculinity makes it impossible to produce the community necessary for healing or for probing deeper into political thought. It is not until significantly later in the novel that Abel, that Abel comes to an understanding of community right, and is able to transform himself. The murder he performs produces a profound isolation rather than a deep connection to others, and it is this that marks his actions as irredeemably masculinist and unproductive. Similarly, although native son's bigger Thomas accidentally kills Mary Dalton, he uses this unintended murder as a source of self-creation convincing himself that the act was not, in fact, incidental, but willful, right, the novel says of Bigger. The thought of what he had done, the awful horror of it, the daring associated with such actions formed for him, for the first time in his fear-ridden life, a barrier of protection between him and a world he feared. He had murdered and had created a new life for himself. Denying that the murder was an accident and using it to construct a masculine self, Bigger creates a being whose basis is murderous feeling, a feeling that ultimately cannot be directed towards its intended target. Thus, his willful murder, right, the one he imagines, redounds internally as the killing of his black female lover named Bessie. Bigger's murder of Bessie is a murder of a possible black communiality. In Native Son, Bessie speaks mostly in the form of questions constantly asking Bigger, much to his irritation, about his life and inner world. 
Although she is a target of violence rather than the one who engages it, Bigger's murder of Bessie is itself a murder of a black feminist rendition of retribution. Bessie constantly tries to cultivate community and intimacy with Bigger, but, he, right, his, um, but her actions are always forestalled by his refusal to share. Her constant questioning, her hard romance and death at the hands of her lover, and her name invokes the drama of the blues, the figure of the murderous blues woman, and the mastery of Bessie Smith. Angela Davis argues that even the murderous renown of the blues woman functions as a model of community creation outside of masculine and patriarchal conceptions of power and reproduction. The blues woman cultivates a non-reproductive community through her instructional advice to women on how to navigate intimate and public violence. Davis says, Ma Rainey, for example, begins Jelly Bean Blues by asking, did you ever wake up with your good man on your mind? The song then proceeds to describe the subject's state of mind in the aftermath of her lover's desertion. The initial question establishes a relationship of intimacy and familiarity with her female audience. The question of intimacy broached by the blues woman is, indel is indelibly bound to the response of violent retribution she sometimes offer, both to her jilting lover and to the white world, right, and as advice to her female audience. For example, in the first recorded blues song by Mamie Smith, right, the protagonist, sing, the protagonist sings, now the doctor's gonna do all that he can, but what you're going to need is an undertaker man. I ain't had nothing but bad news, now I got the crazy blues. I'm going to do like a Chinaman, go and get some hop, get myself a gun and shoot myself a cop. I ain't had nothing but bad news, now I got the crazy blues. Binding murder to an interrogative grammar attempts to open up a tradition of black and indigenous resistance found in the blues and other black and indigenous folk and artistic traditions. The traditions of the Christian Jeremiah, the bad man and bad woman and crazy nigger in the blues is significant to the development and ubiquity of retributive violence as black and indigenous literary and artistic trope and to its questioning form. The figure of the bad man and bad woman, as Adam Gussau explains, an is an individual who, usually an African-American, oh, I think I, an Af I skipped out that quote, so, quote, an African-American willing to use violence against whites in defense of his person, family, dignity, and in the face of deadly white reprisal that supposedly made such self-defense suicidal. These figures became a staple in blues and folk ballads against vigilante um, ballads, uh, Blues and folk ballad vigilante violence against white citizens, the police officers in the, and the police officers in the Jim Crow South, end quote. The Encyclopedia of American Poetry adds to this, explaining that the African-American murder ballad generally spends less time on the horror of the crime and show more sympathy for the plight of the murderer. Here, the blues is doubly significant because it is also an important site of black and indigenous interaction made possible by the crucible of slavery in the settler-occupied territory of the Mississippi South. Of the blues, Native American scholar Jody Bird explains, although the readings of, um, explain, sorry, organized as a call and response with leaders improvising and riffing on identity, history, community, and politics, the song gestures to prior forms of musical presence in the South that tie to the African traditions and to Southeast, Southeastern Indian stomp dance songs that are also call and response, with leaders singing about the politics, concerns, and spiritual matters of the community. More than seeking to make a prior claim to the blues, Bird engages the blues as an epistemology of sorrow from which to articulate black and Native American suffering, interaction, and shared questioning. The women characters in Sherman Alexie's Reservation Blues and Indian Killer also invoke murder and the native people central to the blues, such as Court the Allen Jazz and swing singer Mildred Bailey. These women characters in Alexie's novel also present important moments for, um, right, for offering scathing criticism of Alexie himself and his often and frequent abuse of indigenous women writers. Although the readings offered above do not engage these literary works in their full scope, I offer these multiple moments of vengeful imagining to indicate a tradition and a trope. I also aim to emphasize that feminist and queer renditions of this trope often take the grammar of a question. 
literary and artistic work such as the ones I have highlighted today participate in a long tradition of retribution in Black and Native American literature. These representations become framed and reframed in the participatory formula of the call and response song and becomes right, the cornerstone of the blues. And as various African American scholars have argued, the blues is central to the development of literature in the early 20th century, but even more importantly to the late 20th century where the novel comes to take the form and content of the blues explicitly. It is, in the 1960s, it is in the 1960s and 70s that a significant proliferation of murderous sentiment emerges as central to the production of a black and Native American literary canon. As Joshan Aviles explains, women and queer writers engaged, experimented, and transformed nationalist dis nationalism despite its masculinist and homophobic tendencies. I agree with Aviles and indicate that for queer and feminist black and indigenous writers from the 1960s onwards, violence and retribution was and is an important source of literary experimentation and questioning. Nevertheless, murder is somewhat a counterintuitive black and native tool. Unlike killing that assumes no immediate order or revolt that abandons the order of the law altogether, murder assumes it wholeheartedly. It is a civil crime. As secretive desire and as decisive person-to-person -person encounter, murder evidences, quote, the every man for himself discourse, end quote, that Fanon says must be prohibited when the police arrive, because either all or none must be saved. Retributive murder's inevitable emphasis on the individual and its supplanting of a feeling of malice for one of care, nevertheless bind it back to the structure of the law, the very source and agony of its iteration. Precisely because murder must inevitably fail as a native and black literary tool due to its singularity and intimacy with the law, it only registers the power to pose the question. It poses queries concerning the false sanctity of white life and the inevitable fall of the West. The literary works I explore here do not shun violence so much as they wade through its causes, complications, and consequences. These works indicate that if violence is to be engaged, it must be done under duress, and as, and as a strategic engagement of defense, a tool to be discarded when the contexts have shifted, a moment rather than an event in itself. The point of literary vengeance is not merely to cathect emotions concerning black and native suffering through the death of the colonizer, but to interrogate through critical and unwavering questioning, right, the systems of white violence and justice that cause black and indigenous suffering and fantasies of revenge in the first place. Thank you. Professor Gray. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so Song of Solomon is a kind of very interesting and important text uh, for this trajectory. Because it is also, I think, Marson's most masculinist text, right? It's her homage to her father and to the, right, the men of the community. And it kind of begins with the, with the procession of the great fathers. And so she's right, trying to work through the way uh, right, that masculinity right, kind of immediately reaches for violence as a response, but the kind of uncritical way that it often thinks about the consequences of those violence. And so I think uh, right, guitar provides this beautiful moment and figure through which to uh, right, contemplate that problem precisely because his justification that he offers right, is love, absolutely love, right? So when Milkman says, oh, but you're doing the same thing like they are, and, right, and what makes you right, your actions different from them? And he says, love, right? I do not act out of hatred for anyone. I, I don't hate them. I love the community that I'm attempting to defend, right? And so I think that he is trying to offer a kind of more dynamic representation of what it might be to imagine vengeance. But ultimately, I think what Morrison also wants to get to is that even in that context, precisely because it 
doesn't raise to the level of revolt, right? It has unintended consequences, which is right um, the, the death of Milkman's aunt at the end, who right has uh, who gets shot. And so, right, I think these uh, women writers and queer writers are really trying to offer us a kind of more dexterous approach to, right, the language of black nationalism so that at the very least, even if we engage those practices, we are fully aware of what might be possible, right? And I think Meridian is also a pretty good example of that, right? She, uh, in the end, she, she answers the question, like, no, I cannot personally engage in that violence, but I will be the spiritual soul of those who do to remind them why they would do such a thing. And so in that way, I guess she's offering the reminder of the love, right, that Guitar mentions as the source of his actions. And so she will be the spiritual guidance. But then she kind of immediately is like, but I still don't even know if I could do that, right? So it's, it's this kind of attempt to really hold in view the consequences of even contemplating violence. And some of that also has to do not just with the consequences of kind of what it does to black people, but the full expectation that white folk won't even, even brook the conversation precisely because they don't, right, the, the incremental changes that, uh, that can be made, or the, sorry, the changes that are made are so incremental and small that it, and often, right, rolled back, that it demonstrates a kind of hard reticence to even approach the problem that is created by colonialism. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you know the context of the history of the women who were there. Yeah. And everything you're saying would would one hundred percent um they'd be like, yeah. yeah. You know? Like it would resonate with them. But they wouldn't have understood anything. Yeah. And so my question is just like for someone who is gonna go into education as well, mm -hmm. who wants to, to dive into these ideas but with people yeah. who don't don't have access to this language, what it were your I mean, let the literature do the work. I, I, uh, I, I you know, um, one of the things I, I got the most out of Northwestern and John Jay is right that uh, literature really speaks, especially ones that are about, right, um, that are connected to you, are close to you. Right, they really kind of allow you to, or they give you a vocabulary that you didn't know you have. Right, so one of the kind of important moments that I remember from cases that was ultimately my writing in my letter of intent for graduate school was I was teaching um, uh, Tupac, uh, a Tupac poem, a Maya Angelou poem, and a Robert, uh, a Robert Frost poem, and an Edmund Spencer poem. And it was the Edmund Spencer poem that kind of, there was one student in the back who was totally ignoring me, had a newspaper up, right? Everyone else was participating. And it was Edmund Spencer's My Love is Like to Ice and I to Fire. And so when I asked them what the poem meant, right, all, they went through all the other ones, right, uh, with, you know, with interest and some ease. But this one, they like, right, they hit a wall. And this student just put his paper down and was like, oh, it's like when you like a girl and she don't like you back, but you like her all the more because she don't like you, and then put the paper back up. <laughs> right, so he clearly and completely understood the poem, right, because for some reason it spoke to him. It offered a moment or an experience that was familiar to him that he could right, dissect its meaning and offer a commentary that no one else could, right, could have extracted, and especially no one else who was actually paying attention. Right? So it demonstrated to me that one, he was actually listening, right? and two, that despite the kind of denseness of this text, he found something to hook his hat on. And so I think literature, precisely because it's about our ability to share and it acknowledges, right, despite right, um, despite kind of Europe's attempt to offer a singular narrative of the world, that there is a kind of significant shared experience that we have that cannot be solely framed, right, and absolutely framed through their lens. Um, and so he could see a connection, probably that, right, some of us might not assume that was there. And so, I mean, the only advice is to, right, one, offer literature at the very least that will allow them to begin to think that literature is important, and then introduce them to as many pieces as possible, because you never know who or what Right, connection they might they might construct in the engagement with those texts. Yeah. Professor Reitz. I have a question Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or in like an African American hard model. Yeah. And stuff like it, it seems really unfair that we no. have to struggle with literature and ask you about all these other things. But 
Yeah. In terms of the class, in terms of how people might be experiencing this yeah. message through or through our mission, what would you say? How, how would that work in your classroom? Um, how would it work in your classroom? Okay, so that's an, I mean, that's an interesting question and, um, I, I guess in, ter um, in terms of how I'm thinking about popular form, uh, insofar as right, canonical literature, especially the ones of the 1970s, uh, right, to a degree are popular form. Right? They're also just a form sanctioned by the kind of, you know, um, uh, by the intellectual apparatus, right? and specifically the European intellectual apparatus of the university. And so they acknowledge right, a kind of constant vein present, but won't name the fullness of it. And I think popular genres, at the very least, will fully name that. Right. And so African-American murder and mystery novels, right, fully enter that frame as the frame through which they are inviting people to engage. But precisely because it's also kind of the force through which they're in making that invitation, we often take it for granted. Right. And so I think in the canonical moments, we will right, they occur as small kernels and they're not the central focus of the narrative itself. And so they do offer us both a kind of way to critique. Uh, right, the institution that sanctions can, um, canonicity and determines what is valuable and what is not. But it also tells us that insofar as they are consumed by uh, right, uh, academic literati, that um, one, white audiences love narratives of their own demise precisely because it's located and confined in the, te in the context of art. Right? So in either canonical literature or in popular form, it's totally cool to engage precisely because it's purely artistic it has no relationship to reality, and they cannot see the other historical context and means right, that produce these literatures in the first place. Um, and so what something like Get Out does is it, right, it appeals to that sense of, uh, of flagellation and guilt right, through the consumption of art without having to right, demand necessarily an explicit attention to the real world practices and principles that might uh, produce those, uh, right, those texts in the first place. But I'm, I, yeah, I'm not exactly sure if I'm responding to the kind of nitty gritty of the division between canonicity and, and popular form, right? But yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, what I like about Get Out is that, right, in the end, when we assume that he is going to kill the young white lady, he in fact leaves her alone, right, to be a, a, a to die by her own hand, which she does, right. And so, insofar as um, right, whiteness is a European product, it is also right, probably the means through which right, uh, the West will end itself, right. It will, it is the thing that will cause Europe's right, Europe's downfall. And that I think is at the very least what some of these texts are really asking us to hold in view. Not necessarily that anyone should go and engage retributive murder, right, but that we have to hold in view that the West is not an inevitability, that it won't be forever, right, the dominant structure of the globe and that one day by either murder or, right, old age will pass from the world. Right? And I think we lose that with a kind of full spread of Europe as a global form, with a constant binding and bringing closer together of the, right, the World Wide Web. And so all the kind of different possibilities and other ways of living seem to kind of lose efficacy or just disappear under the singular narrative of a European form. And so I think they are just asking us to, hold, to ask questions and to hold out right, the possibility that nothing lives forever. Any other questions? Nico. Hey, Chad. What's going on, Nico? <laughs> um, so what do you think this means then in terms of like how one internalizes these narratives? And then depending on their sort of like lived experience, right, either as a white black indigenous person or all the people in between like mestizos across the country or um, people from Southeast Asia, East Asia, and they're engaging with the canonical Right, and mm. legitimacy because the question of right in this like new era yeah. where we're all talking about mass incarceration reform and then the counter argument of abolition, which seems to be yeah. the envisioning of a new system of a new world. Yeah. But what of the engagement with yeah. or sort of the, the broader moments of like how Barack Obama yeah. right like reproduces the yeah. system that exists? Yeah, this is something we were talking about earlier in the Vera class today, which is right the kind of catch-22 of the necessity to make and demand right, transformations to the system that exist while still holding the possible and absolute view that one day they will disappear, right? Because the minute that we, uh, right, 
the minute that we stop asking or imagining that they will disappear, right, we are stuck with them absolutely, and even incremental change becomes near impossible, right? And so, right, the if right, um, it probably was very difficult for enslaved African Americans to imagine the end of slavery, considering its kind of scopic uh, nature and its right, its its kind of its claw hold on American society. But if they had stopped at any moment in time, precisely for that reason, right, then we would not have had the transformations that were made possible by their own activism as well as other circumstances and factors. And so I think the, the important thing here is the power to pose the question, right? Which we are losing. I think these texts are saying that uh, we are near to not even being able to ask the question about whether or not we could have another world. And so insofar as the people who engage the criminal justice system still hold in view that, right, one day this will go, right? That alone, I think, is what, um, or that, not alone, but that is, is one of the most productive aspects. So I think some of the best people who are doing work in those arenas recognize that there is no one thing that could change the pro or fix the problem of the criminal justice system. That they would, you would need to improve education, right? You would need to improve other um, right, housing and resources. You would need to improve, right? And so they understand, and those people have a kind of full scope of what, of what is necessary. They just know that they don't have a magic wand that could wave, uh, they could wave and make all of those things appear. And so at the very least, if an acknowledgement of that difficulty and fully speaking it, while still right, hardly advocating for whatever changes are possible, I think that's literally, you know, and, and that's the small right, uh, kernel of hope that these texts are asking us to hold on to precisely because we are so close to losing it, right? So close, yeah. All right. And I'm going to call that a wrap. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Unless there's really one more question. No.